Hey everyone, in the last video I covered what motors, motor drivers, processors, and many more electronics I was planning on using for Robodog. In this video I'll focus mainly on mechanical engineering. I'll show you how I go from dimensions on a piece of paper to a 3D CAD model, to 3D printing those parts, and afterwards we'll assemble everything together and see how it fits. The 3D printed parts I'll be making in this video will just be a prototype. I do plan on eventually making these parts out of metal so that it's more durable. So the area of the Robodog I'm going to focus on for this video is the shoulder joint, which would be located here. I need to somehow be able to connect the motors together so that it will be able to create this forward and backward motion, as well as this side to side motion. These movements are in two different directions, so I need two motors to replicate this movement. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First off, let's just create an accurate 3D model of the hoverboard motor. This will eventually help me size my design to the motor in the CAD software. Now many of you already familiar with 3D CADing might be wondering why I'm not just going to an open source CAD site, like GrabCAD, where I can just download 3D models that someone else made. While I did find some 3D models of hoverboard motors in GrabCAD, they were not the exact size I needed. Also, all the models I saw still had the rubber wheel on it. When you import CAD files from a different CAD software, you're basically importing one solid object and it becomes a lot more difficult to make any changes you need to the 3D model. For this reason, I'll be creating the hoverboard motor from scratch. Before I 3D CADed the motor, I first took several measurements with some calipers and I wrote them down. Here are the measurements I took. So now that we have the measurements, the next thing to do is CAD the motor. Unfortunately, this would be too long of a video if I showed me CADing everything, so I'll just show you what the end model looks like. But if you're curious about what I did and want to watch the whole video of me catting, I'll be releasing another video after this one where me and a friend just casually hang out and talk over the pre-recorded footage. We can sometimes get into pretty deep and interesting conversations, so you should check it out. So now that we have the hoverboard motor catted, we can get to the actual design for how I'm going to mount these two motors together. I was thinking something like this. Let's break this down one part at a time. Here's the base adapter. This will go on the bottom face of the hub like this and I'll use the already existing screws that came with the hoverboard motor to fasten the adapter down to the hub. This will be all one piece when I print this from the 3D printer. Here's the top coupling piece of the adapter. This will clamp down on another motor shaft like this. These are the threaded inserts. I'm using these just for the 3D print. They basically just create a metal thread inside the hole of the 3D print so that I can have metal to metal contact when I place in the screws. These particular inserts are forced into the 3D print by heating up the insert until it melts into the hole. You normally do this with a soldering iron. This is why this part here is a bit too big for the hole, and will eventually be melted into the plastic. This tapered part here is used to guide the insert into the hole as you push it down. The last piece of hardware to show here are the screws. They are M5 screws that are 20 millimeters in length. Both the insert and screw CAD models came from the McMaster Car website. McMaster Car has a neat feature on their website where you can download pretty much any part they sell as a 3D CAD model and import it into your CAD software to see if it will fit into your design. These seem to fit in well with the design, so I use these parts. So this is how everything should look. Now it's time to 3D print some of these parts to get a feel for how everything connects. Prototyping your parts like this is a good way to catch any errors for how things fit together in your overall design. 3D printing parts during the prototyping phase also allows me to iterate on design to make it better at a very low cost. There's nothing quite like physically holding something in your hands to realize all the things you want to change about it. To 3D print the parts in Fusion 360, you can select the part to find out where the file exists in the tree hierarchy. Then, right click and select Save as STL. You'll see a little pop-up come up. I have the Send to 3D Print Utility checkbox selected. Then, select Cura as a print utility. Cura is a separate software program that you'll need to install that is independent of Fusion 360. It's what's known as a slicer tool. Slicer tools like Cura are used to essentially slice up the 3D model into layers so that 3D printers will know how to print that part. So once you send the part to Cura, we can arrange it on the printer bed however we want. We check to make sure that the printer configuration is correct, then we press the prepare button. For a 100% infill part, which means that the part is completely solid with plastic on the inside, we can see that Cura is telling us that the printer will take 2 hours and 17 minutes to complete. We then click Save to Removable Device, and it will save what is known as G-Code to the SD card. G-Code is a huge topic and could have a video in and of itself, so for now, we'll just say that G-Code is all the data the 3D printer needs to know to print the part. Next, we stick the SD card in the 3D printer and select the name of the part. 
Because I just exported the STL file from Fusion 360 itself, it just named the file random characters. To prevent this and give it a name, I could have just exported the STL file itself, named it, then import it into Cura. But I only have a few parts I need to print, so it's not that big of a deal. Once I select Accept, the 3D printer heats up the surface of the bed and the nozzle of the extruder head where the plastic comes out. Because I have a USB connected between my 3D printer and my computer, I'm able to monitor certain aspects of the 3D printing process from my computer, like the temperatures of the bed and the extruder. Once the print has reached the desired temperatures for the bed and the nozzle, the part starts to be 3D printed. The printer first starts out by printing out a brim, or border, around the part so that it can help the part have more surface area and stick to the bed throughout the entire printing process. But as the printer began printing, I noticed that the plastic was getting stuck on the extruder nozzle and not the bed, so I tried removing part of the brim that was clumping up and getting in the way of the extruder. This seemed to work at first, but things started getting a little out of hand. The plastic was clumping up and forming a ball near the extruder, so I stopped the print and tried starting it again. Similar to the first attempt, the initial plastic the extruder was laying out wasn't sticking to the bed, and so I removed what it had printed by hand. After that, it seemed pretty good until it wasn't. The holes weren't looking that great. A little bit later, you could start to see that part of the corner was lifting up from the print. With all these problems I was getting, I just decided to rip off the tape that was on the printer and just use the glass instead. The tape I was using was specifically designed for printed parts to stick on it, and it was supposed to be good for multiple uses. I only printed on it a few times since then, but I guess I wore it down enough to where the plastic didn't even want to stick to it anymore. I also had a suspicion that the bed wasn't heating up enough for the plastic to stick because the tape probably had a lower conductivity, which resulted in less heat flow from the glass bed to the plastic. I also took a glue stick and applied the glue across the bed to make extra sure the part would stick. This may seem weird, but this is actually a common technique that is done when you print parts so that you can have the parts stick to the bed better. And just for extra measure, I also recalibrated the 3D printer. So now, finally, back to trying to print this thing. And it doesn't stick. After taking a closer look, I realized that the nozzle was a little closer to the bed than it should be, which caused the plastic to not really come out. I already recalibrated everything, even after applying the layer of glue that I put on the bed, so I'm not exactly sure why it's doing this. Because the nozzle was too close, this definitely seemed like a calibration issue, so I recalibrated the printer for a second time. So after the second recalibration, I started the print for a fourth time. Like the previous times, it started out a little shaky. I tried to remove the loose strand, but the extruder kept getting in my way. I figured the loose strand was far enough away from the part that it wouldn't bother it, so I just left it. After watching the print for a while, it looked pretty good. The plastic looked like it was making a good connection with the bed now. After the part was done, I pried it off the bed, then I tore off the brim. I also got the motor just to see how well the part fits onto the shaft. Unfortunately, the part looks a tiny bit small. This is because when you make parts out of plastic, they tend to shrink by a little bit once they cool down. I should have accounted for this in the CAD model, but this is okay. It's not too small and we'll make this work. Here's a close-up of the part one more time. The next thing we're going to do is print the base adapter. We do this in the exact same way we did with the other part. I check to make sure all the configurations are correct. Then I press prepare. So for this part, since it's a little bit bigger than the part we printed before, it's going to take longer to print. I'm doing a 50% infill on this part, so it'll be a little weaker since it's not 100% filled with plastic, but it won't take as long to print. This is showing 4 hours and 54 minutes to complete. I think at 100% fill it was around 6.5 hours or so. Like before, I export the G-code to the SD card and I give the SD card to the printer. This time, the printer started up pretty well. I didn't even have to grab any strangling pieces. The rest of the printing process was pretty smooth and I didn't have any issue. Here's a time lapse. Here's the print all finished. 
I'd already let the part cool down so it was pretty easy to remove. Here I'm just tearing off the brim of the adapter. So the intention with these holes in the adapter are that they're supposed to be countersink through holes that align with the hub's countersink threaded holes. As you can see though, the screws are a pretty tight fit due to the plastic shrinking. Regardless though, we can still get them all the way through if I twist the screws. So I'm basically tapping a thread into the hole when I do this. If I really wanted to, I could take a drill press and widen the holes, but that's not really a big deal here. As long as I'm able to tighten down the base adapter onto the hub, that's all that matters. Even though there was some tiny shrinkage, the adapter base still fits on pretty nicely to the hub. As I was in the process of CADing and 3D printing the parts, I purchased two more additional hoverboard motors since I only had one. As I opened it, I was sort of thrown off by the fact that the pattern on the hub looked a little bit different than the pictures I saw on Amazon. I did some measurement comparisons between the new motors and the motors I had, and everything seemed to be about the same size, which was good. I'm hoping I don't run into issues later on with various hoverboard motors having different characteristics or anything. It's something I'll have to keep in mind and be careful about in the future. In addition to the motors I bought, I also purchased the inserts and screws that I used on my 3D model for McMaster Car. Just to get a closer look, here are what the inserts look like. And here are the screws I got. In the 3D CAD model, I actually made the sizes of these holes 1mm larger than I needed them to be. And I'm glad I did, because with the plastic shrinking, I was just able to get the tapered section of the inserts into the holes with a little help from a mallet. Now for the fun part. I set my soldering iron between 300 and 350 degrees Celsius, and I pressed them against the inserts. Within a few seconds, I saw them melting into the plastic. I continued to do this for the rest of the inserts. Just to see how everything fits together, I screwed in the top of the adapter. I noticed that there was a gap between the two pieces because when the plastic melted, some of it raced to the surface and solidified. So I took some sandpaper and shaved down the excess and reattached the top adapter piece. Here's what it looks like now. Last thing to do is attach the two motors together. At first I was a little nervous for the adapter to bear the full weight of the motor since the motors aren't exactly light. The whole apparatus here comes in about 11.6 pounds, or 5.26 kilograms. But I started to get a little bit more rough with it, and it seemed just fine. So, here it is. From some dimensions on a piece of paper, to 3D CAD models, to physically creating your design and holding it in your own hands. I hope you found my process here useful. If you did, or if you have any questions about anything I did, let me know in the comments. Thank you all for watching.